I have this dream where I've forgotten to go to class for the entire term. Sometimes it's a calculus class, sometimes it's a different type of class like English. And it's finals week, and I don't even know what the syllabus is because I don't have it. And I've got all these thoughts. Why didn't I just drop the class? Can I cram and take the final? Will I still fail anyhow? Maybe I can just explain it to someone and they'll give me a break. Did I just spend a bunch of money on tuition to make my GPA lower? What am I going to tell my parents? Things were going so well, why did I just throw this opportunity away? And then I wake up, and I'm anxious, and I have this shame. Then I convince myself I'm not in college anymore, and I breathe a sigh of relief. But it's a temporary relief, because then I think to myself, is there something I'm forgetting right now? And then I add anxiety to the shame. I had this nightmare all the time, and I used to hate it. It's a terrible way to start the day, but now I know that when I'm having this dream, I'm not actually in trouble. It's that my brain is actively priming itself for optimal performance. My name is Steve Huynh, and I'm an L7 software engineer. On my channel, we take a structured and engineering approach to your life and career. Basically, it's everything I wish I knew when I was just starting out. Today, I thought that we should go over the relatively new science of forgetting and how I leverage this understanding to optimize my learning and to maintain a clear head. It's one of the big things that I wish I had known about and capitalized earlier in my career. When I first started, I had a coworker with decades of experience. Let's call him Bob. One day, I called Bob out after he overlooked a detail on a project we were working on. After we had cleaned things up, he told me, I've forgotten more than you've ever known. I rolled my eyes and I thought to myself, Bob should get his head checked out. He's starting to lose it. Forgetting was thought to represent a glitch in your cognitive processes. You had a memory, and it decayed before it was eventually wiped away from your brain. And that's how it feels when you can't find your phone or when there's a word on the tip of your tongue. Your memory was there, and then it was just erased from your head. That is, until Hermann Ebbinghaus started his research in the late 1800s on what's known as transient forgetting, or temporary forgetting. He created sets and sets of gibberish words and syllables and memorized them until he could recall them twice in a row. Later, he would try to recall these words at different intervals in the future, and he did this over and over again over the course of six years. The result of this years-long experiment is the famous Ebbinghaus forgetting curve. The x-axis is time, and the y-axis is what he calls savings, or the proportion of time savings he would reap when he tried to relearn the gibberish words at that time t. If he tried to relearn something after a short duration, the savings were really good. In other words, he could quickly relearn things. If he tried to relearn after a longer amount of time, the savings weren't as high, but it still wasn't as though he started at zero. And the best part is that the rate of decay of savings wasn't as fast in subsequent learnings. There was this residue with memories and learning. Contemporary scientists are starting to think that forgetting isn't simply decay over time, but rather a novel brain state that's different from the ones before the learning occurred and also from when the learning is remembered. And it's not just human beings. It looks like it's anything with a nervous system. Researchers from Harvard in 2022 taught some worms to smell and identify a bacterial pathogen that makes them sick. It took about four hours for the worms to learn and the researchers could demonstrate that the worm avoided this pathogen based on what was taught to them. And in an hour, the worms forgot this learning. When they retaught the worms to identify that pathogen, it only took them 15 minutes. In Ebbinghaus terms, they had a savings rate of about 94%. There are these learning tricks you can use if you absolutely need to remember something, like for a test, called active recall and spaced repetition, which is where you basically recreate an optimal version of Ebbinghaus's experiment. You use things like flashcards to test yourself on the subject matter, and then space the learning intervals to optimize on the savings rate in an attempt to maximize retention for a specific target date. Common intervals are an hour, a day, a week, and a month. But this video isn't on remembering things or studying. The real world, once you get out of school, isn't structured like a course where there's a midterm and final date target. And there's a very real trap, which I've fallen into, where I treat my working life like an extended version of school, and it held me back. I thought that I could pack my head with more and more things, and that meant that I was getting crazy smart. But there's a big problem with this idea. It takes time and energy to keep things primed and ready to go in your head, even if the savings rate is high. And you have finite time and energy. That holds you back from doing other things because you're stuck trying to stay in the past. Now, I've done over 850 technical interviews over the course of my career. I used to pride myself on staying on top of what all of the other tech companies were asking during their interviews. 
The stakes are high during these things. Doing well means you get a high paying job and that can change you and your family's life. And so when I interviewed people, I wanted to make sure I was being fair, that I was always asking questions where I knew the answers deeply, and that I could give really good hints if people got stuck on these notoriously hard coding problems. And so it became a duty for me to stay on top of what every company was asking and to make sure that I could myself solve all of the questions at depth. Every morning I would wake up and grind a bunch of leak code questions. At first it was kind of fun, but then it became a chore and then it became a problem because I wasn't looking for another job. And so I could have used that bandwidth on so many other things. In a sense, I was doing what Ebbinghaus did, which was learning a bunch of gibberish words and syllables. I was memorizing and learning for the sake of learning. It turns out that getting good at interview programming questions doesn't make you a better software engineer. There's a gigantic disparity between what people ask during interviews and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, because what they do at work takes much longer than what can be done in an hour. And so what people ask during interviews are complicated things, usually requiring specific knowledge with some sort of trick or critical insight that can be solved in a short amount of time. Topics like recursion and dynamic programming, I've barely ever used in my professional career. I know Kung Fu. Really? All I needed was to do a bit of prep on a couple of questions when an interview was coming up. I was holding myself back because I didn't want to forget anything. Not smart. David Allen said, your mind is for having ideas, not holding them. Our mind should be used for creativity, coming up with ideas, making connections, and thinking clearly about what to do next, not cluttered with things that we can quickly relearn. It makes more sense to have a cycle of learning and forgetting, storing critical information in a place where we can access it when needed and letting the rest go. That's why I'm so excited about today's sponsor, Notion. Been using it every day for the past two years and now I can't live without it. Notion is an all-in-one workspace for notes, tasks, and projects. It's designed and optimized to help you organize information, collaborate with others, and get more done. With Notion, you can store and organize all of your notes, tasks, and information in one spot, making it easier to find what you need when you need it, so you can declutter the space in your head. They have a desktop and mobile app, as well as a fully featured web interface, so you can get stuff done wherever you are whenever you need to. One of the most important projects to stay on top of is your career. When I think about my career, I think about it in two parts. Retrospective, what have I done and achieved? And prospective, what do I want to do in the future? I keep my achievements in what I call a brag book in Notion. Whenever I do something impactful that I don't want to forget, I just click on the new button to insert a new entry. When I click it, I create an instance of a template I developed for brag entries. I fill out the prompts for a summary, the context, and document my impact. If you're a dev like me, you can format the text with Markdown inline. Notion allows me to embed images like screenshots and other files on the page so I can be thorough as I record the details. To track my goals and plans, I have another simple database. This is where I track my yearly and quarterly goals and also do weekly planning, all with the same template I created. I record whether it's for the year, quarter, or week, the current status, and the start and end date. Whenever I create a new weekly plan, I just hit the new button and create an instance of the template for a plan that I've developed that fits my system and I'm ready to go. I have sections here for related plans, reflection, intention, commitment, and the goal items themselves. The goal items within this plan are an embedded database where I can track the progress and status of individual entries. It's really powerful that all of my plans and goals are consolidated in one spot. I can easily go back to prior plans and mine them for things to add to my brag document. If I need to refresh my resume or come up with good stories for behavioral interviews, I can just go to the brag book and start from there. I never get the feeling that I've forgotten something important about my career. Notion includes a wide range of templates to get started for whatever you're doing, so you can quickly create different types of project plans, task list, journal, and much more. You can also collaborate with others in real time, adding comments, suggesting changes, and working together on projects. My wife and I use it to keep track of the endless home projects we have going on. And of course, I use it to track my YouTube content and to script my videos. The best part is that Notion is free to use. Use the link in the description to get started and see if it's right for you. Notion is the best, and I'm so glad to be working with him. It's changed my life and made me so much more effective, efficient, and productive. What was I talking about? Oh yeah, forgetting. I guess what I'm saying is that optimally, what we want is mental clarity. You want a clear mind when you're deciding what you should do next, whether that's within the next hour or the next month or the next year. And then you wanna switch gears and do it. 
Put your energy into coding or researching a topic, making plans, gaining skills, and studying. And we want to fill our minds and make some progress. Then what you want to do is transiently forget so you can make room for the next thing. This way we can have a clear mind to come up with creative solutions, think about what we should do next with our lives, and ultimately make the best decisions that we possibly can. That's the evolutionary reason to have a good memory. Memory is not meant for us to simply reminisce about old times. Animals with better memories exhibit better decision-making and survival skills, and are therefore better competitors. If an animal doesn't forget where they stash their food, they have a higher likelihood of surviving the cold winter. But without forgetting, the evolutionary benefits of a strong memory diminish. There's a story by Borges where the main character is injured in an accident and for some reason suddenly can't forget anything. He can learn many languages and becomes a human copy of Wikipedia, but on steroids. His mind has no filter and every little thing is remembered. And he's miserable because he can't let go of anything. Memories don't comfort him, they overwhelm him, and they torture him. Think of creative work like traffic. If the roads are at 95 to 100% capacity, things grind to a halt. What I want are free flowing thoughts so I can quickly make connections across contexts and domains. So I can use my head for having great thoughts, not for storing them. Scientists in 2021 published a paper in Nature where they isolated a neuron that regulates dopamine in fruit flies. When artificially activated, they were able to demonstrate that this triggered memory suppression that led to transient forgetting while leaving long-term memory unaffected. So when you're trying to actively learn something, you should avoid things that would disrupt your dopamine regulation because it may literally make you forget what you're doing. When we get a notification, like from our smartphones, we're compelled to check things to see what happened. Not only do these messages break your attention and affect your memory, they can also increase cortisol and your stress levels. These sort of disruptions also train you to proactively check your phones, emails or Slack, reinforcing a cycle of low-grade transient forgetting. The biggest problem with notifications, though, isn't the forgetting, it's that they come at random times and not on a set schedule you control. They come when they come. We should attempt to clear our minds on our schedule. So how should we forget? I'm a big proponent of setting an intention of when I check my email, Slack, and phone messages right before I start a block of work. So if I have a block of 90 minutes where I need to knock something out, like doing research for a YouTube video on forgetting, and it's 8.15 a.m., I'll turn notifications off until 9.45. If something pops into my head that I shouldn't forget during this block, instead of doing something that might expose me to my email or phone, I have a pad of paper to write things down. When 9.45 rolls around, I can do all the things, take a walk, whatever I need to do. There are many scientists who suspect that transient forgetting is not a natural process of decay, but an active process to aid in our cognition, mostly occurring when we sleep. And it all makes so much sense now. When we sleep, we actively forget. Your mind takes out the proverbial trash so you can live in a clutter-free home when you wake up in the morning. A good night's sleep quite literally produces a clearer mind. I'm convinced that's why big ideas come to you while brushing your teeth or why shower thoughts are a thing. They are the result of the active forgetting cycle that occurs during sleep. If you're an entry-level software engineer, I've forgotten more than you've ever learned. And I hope that you can say that when you have 20 years of experience too. So now, when I get that nightmare about forgetting that I had registered for a class, it's a reminder to me that forgetting things while I sleep is what it's supposed to do. Forgetting is priming me for optimal performance to have great creative thoughts and ideas.